Welcome, everyone. My name is Mike Wickers. I'm the mayor of Cottonwood Heights as of yesterday. We uh, ha have uh, two new council members as well. Uh, to my right, El um, council member John Newell, and to his right, council member Ellen, Ellen Burrell. We're excited to be here <clears throat> this evening. We are gonna uh, start tonight with a Pledge of Allegiance and uh, Doug Peterson has offered to lead us in the, that, if you would please stand. Thank you. Member Peter. So the next item on our agenda tonight for our Conwood Heights City Council business meeting is, is uh, 3.1. And this is a fun opportunity for us. We, we uh, as Mayor Peterson used to say, we really look forward to these opportunities to recognize um, how amazing citizens, some of the citizens are within our community. We have tonight with us uh, Aspen, Abby, and Dave Johnson, as well as I believe uh, Chase. And is there one more or is that it? And Dash, okay. So if you all would come up to the podium right now, we would appreciate it, yeah. While they are coming up, let me tell you a little bit about uh, this family. <clears throat> so let me have, uh, if you wouldn't mind, 13 year old Aspen, where is Aspen? So Aspen, you had a birthday party, her birthday not too long ago, right? And then on her birthday, during a birthday celebration, a Aspen noticed that something wasn't normal. And uh, like a good citizen, she uh, um, <clears throat> went and told people that they had some, I, I see smoke, is that what you saw? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she saw smoke coming from a neighbor's home and uh, alerted mom and dad, Dave, right, and Abby, and Abby got on the phone with 911, and Dave went to the neighbor's home, and, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, and, and, and knocked on a door of a, a gentleman who was asleep. He, you knew he was asleep even, so that's a close neighbor. Good job. But, uh, and, and, and knocked and knocked on the door, and, and thanks to, to Abby's awareness uh, and to knocking on that door, they were able to, to, to um, awake uh, Steve, Steve Adamson, is Steve here tonight? Is that, he's right here, yeah, great. And his brother Brad, who's uh, been involved with, or Brent rather, sorry, has been involved as well. Anyway, the, the, uh, the home ended up being, I, th I believe a, a total disaster and, and burned down. And, and we believe that Steve being here has a lot to do with your family. And so we are really, really grateful. And, and uh, R Riley, is Riley here? Okay, sorry, there he is. Riley has an award for your family and we just want to let you know how appreciative we are of you. So, so what I'd like to do is I'll read kind of the write-up that we were given and uh, kind of share some thoughts that I have and then we'll present them with the, uh, we have some certificates and chief coins, which are pretty unique. We only give the chief coins out to people who excelled, gone above and beyond or done something very unique or special what you all have done, so. Um, and luckily we had one of my colleagues, I've known for a while, Brent, continue to remind us. And so there was a little bit of delay with COVID, not meeting in person and not being able to do this in person. He kindly reminded us that this need to, we need to get caught up on this one. So, um, <clears throat> so Brent nominated this family. He shared the story with us. Um, his brother, Steve, was in the family home when it caught fire. And it was an August day in, in 2020, so a little while ago, and, and we know those days for us are dangerous, they're hot, they're dry, and a fire, no matter where it starts in the home and out, outside anywhere, can be very, very fast moving and dangerous. Um, Brent submitted this family just to give us the ability to recognize them for their heroism and their willing to, willingness to act on that day. Um, so as was shared, 13-year-old Aspen Johnson was celebrating her birthday when she noticed smoke coming from her next door neighbor's garage and deck area. She quickly realized this was not normal and told her parents, Dave and Abby Johnson. Dave knew his neighbor Steve was likely home asleep with both of his, both of his dogs immediately ran into the house and, and pounded on the door. 
<clears throat> the fire had now overtaken the garage, the deck, the kitchen, and the living room area. So basically the home is pretty much fully involved, which is a very scary and dangerous situation. Um, Abby called 911 and told the neighbors to the east to evacuate their homes. Um, her son Chase helped knock on other doors of neighbors while watching his younger brother dash. Um, the fire had now burned the fence outside the property and began threatening adjoining houses. So it's moving fast and it's scary. And even with just a small amount of time, that can really happen. Um, <clears throat> Steve finally responded to Dave's urgent banging on the door. He wanted to go back in to save his dogs, but Dave stopped him, saving his life. When firefighters arrived, they described the fire as unsurvivable and could not enter the home to search it. And both dogs, unfortunately, did perish in the fire. So it just shows you how dangerous that situation really was. And it was literally seconds that probably made the difference and, and we're very grateful for them taking that action. Um, and Brent stated clearly, it's clear to me that had Aspen, Abby, Dave, and, and the family not all responded so quickly, just emergency, Steve would not have survived. So it's amazing. And, and what, a couple of thoughts I had as I thought about this, having been in that situation, being trained, even being trained and showing up on that can be very exciting and not exciting, fun, exciting, like, oh man, this is an emergency. We've got a problem here. And the presence of mind that you all had to act the way you did, knock on the doors, get them out of the house, not let them go back in there, call 911, keep track of everybody and do that while it's your birthday. That's pretty exciting. So I, I want to commend you two for your action. Um, that was a selfless act that could have put yourself in danger without any training, without any concern for yourself. And so we want to recognize you for the actions that you guys undertook on that day. So what I have for you is a few certificates. So we have one for each of you. <clears throat> so these are from Chief Peterson. He's, he's actually out of town. So he isn't able to come tonight, but I'm presenting these kind of on his behalf. We have one for Dash. And we also, like I sure we have the Chief's coin. And again, these really go to people who, again, go, have gone above and beyond or done something very unique, either within our organization or in our communities. And so I'd like to give these to you as well. And thank you. I, I can't thank you enough. I'm sure the family feels the same way, but we're really grateful for everything you did that day. Yeah, of course. You're welcome. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for sure. Thank you. I just heard uh, <clears throat> Councilmember Peterson, what a great way to start a meeting. Mm -hmm. There's a moral to that story, Aspen. I think it is the fact that you noticed something wasn't normal and you said something. And I think if we, if, if we continue to do that, to what we can avert uh, disasters. So thank you again. What a great family. So we will now move on to uh, item 4.0, which is our citizen comment period. <clears throat> Before I read the names of the people who have asked it to comment, let me remind you there's, uh, we limit the, the comments to three minutes. And we ask you that you will uh, be civil in your conversation and not attack anyone personally. We want to hear your um, concerns about issues uh, and things that the city can, can look at and what needs to be done. But please be uh, cordial and uh, do not attack anyone personally. So having said that, it looks like our first person is Jennifer Sherland. Sirland. So this is regarding the this is regarding the parking situation on Racket Club Drive. Okay, yeah. so we do have a public hearing yeah. per, portion. So we'll wait to hear so from that's you then. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. 
So the next person that we have would be Ellen Mark. Yeah, absolutely. Gary Thorup. Mayor, council members, my name is Gary Thorup. Uh, my wife and I, Sue, uh, have lived at 3148 East Creek Road, I believe, um, Councilwoman uh, Burrell, that's in your district uh, since 1993. And so we have uh, been there before this was a city and uh, have seen a lot of development and changes occur. Uh, we're here tonight to talk about safety issues. I recognize the three minutes is not very long. Um, if you would like me to elucidate, I'll be happy to answer questions or have one-on-one -on -one discussions later on. But let me identify, first of all, so you'll know, there's four main safety concerns that we are concerned about in our neighborhood. And the neighborhood I'm talking about is uh, Creek Road, probably from the hill east um, all the way up to 3500 east, and also Danish Road from Creek Road south probably where it intersects with Quail Run and, and Wasatch Boulevard. Um, the first problem that we have is speeding up and down Creek Road. Uh, this is not just a summer phenomenon. This is not just a student phenomenon. Uh, this is uh, uh, motorcyclists in groups, not gangs, but groups, um, uh, sports cars, trucks, who think that uh, because there are no houses on the south side of Creek Road that it's uh, they can drive as fast as they want to up Creek Road. The second is speeding along Danish Road going north and south from Creek Road to Quail Run uh, and uh, where it intersects with Wasatch Boulevard. The third is there's too many drivers who are ignoring probably I would call with impunity uh, the four-way stop at the intersection of Creek and Danish Roads. Uh, we not only have people now who are exercising their right to a California rolling stop, but uh, blowing through with impunity. Um, I usually see it at, uh, in the morning when it's a little darker and at night when I'm walking my dog. Uh, my wife might have different uh, perspective as she walks the dog during the daytime. But particularly at night when it's uh, twilight or darker, cars think that they can see the lights, the headlights of other cars coming from other directions. And if they don't see any, they just blow right through that intersection. And just one second, the fourth is lack of enforcement of snow shoveling ordinances on those sections of Creek and Danish where there really are no homes or whether there's a, a fence or a side yard that fronts onto Danish Road, no one's bothering to enforce shoveling ordinances. And I'd be happy to answer questions if there are any. And I have other neighbors who have sub submitted some things that I can't read. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council. Just to go on with, with what Gary was saying, a few, a few um, examples I think would be appropriate. I do have comments that I can submit for the record. Uh, that intersection that we're talking about with Creek and Danish Road, I was walking, I just happened to, I, I live right on the corner. I happened to go out with my dog. There were two women with carriages and they came to the intersection, they stopped and they waved cars on. And I said, why aren't you crossing? I'll, I'll go in the middle if you want me to. And they said, we're too afraid. Cars don't stop for us. And that's what I've seen. And I, I sent video out to Tim and others uh, showing examples of this. I now wear a GoPro every time I walk my dog. And I've got great examples, speeders and not stopping like Gary mentioned. And so it comes to the point where we want a great community. We have a good community, but it, we, we can't be fearful walking down our streets. It just doesn't make any sense for me to go out with a GoPro, for me to look both ways and be worried about somebody pulling over or running, running us over or injuring somebody else. So there's already been one big crash there. There have been many, but one that came about at the end of the summer 
where there were five patrol cars that responded. It was amazing, five patrol cars for just a collision, including the fire department and the, and the paramedics. And so great response there, but we don't see enough patrols. And I think that's what happened just even a couple of days ago, just making a right turn on the green at the station right down here to go to, go to the rec center and a car coming by and nearly colliding with me and, and going head on, nearly head, head on with the, the car going the opposite direction. I have video of that because I have a dash cam. So all of these things I think need to be considered. And that's why we have the traffic calming procedures here, which we printed out. We're hoping to get some signatures, but I don't believe it doesn't, it doesn't make sense for us to do all of this work if there's not gonna be action. And that's what we've, there've been so many complaints, so many uh, emails and phone calls to Tim and the police department. We, we'd like to see more action on this. We want a good community. And, and something else about the noise that we're talking about too. Laguna Beach is a, almost exactly the same size as Cottonwood Heights. I go there often, I've got friends there. And uh, the, the population's a little bit more, uh, and ours is a little bit more. They have a, a noise ordinance, big signs when you enter the city saying you can't go, you can't make a lot of noise with the motorcycles and trucks and whatever other vehicles. And they enforce it, they give out tickets. My friend has seen them give out tickets for the noise. Those are things that can be done to make our community more enjoyable. And uh, that is my hope that we can do this. 13 seconds, I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Sir. Sure. And I'm finding that they're using Danish Road, the skiers, I'm a skier. They're using it as a back road so they don't get caught on Wasatch. And they are going 60 miles an hour to beat all the traffic. And I try not to do that myself, but I've noticed that it's just not safe. And I see so many moms, children just waiting. They don't dare cross at the stop sign. Thank you. Alan, thank you. I appreciate all of those comments. I don't think there is a more important issue than keeping our roads safe and uh, be assured that we will we'll take this, these comments and serious about them. And like I said, Tim Tingey will be uh, in contact and, and uh, keep, please stay engaged with us. We want nothing more than our roads to be safe. And our, uh, thank you. Tim, I don't have any other, is that right? Correct, and I don't see anyone online that wants to comment either, so. Do you need to mention? So their, their comments or their, the documents that they provided will have that as part of the, the record that they submitted tonight. <laughs> we will close then our, uh, our citizen comment period and move to 5.0 on our um, citizen agenda, which public hearing session. 5.1 is a, is a topic of Racket Club Drive parking petition that has been submitted. We will have uh, our economic development director, Mike Johnson, come in. Thank you, Mayor presentation up here and I'll run through it quickly. Okay, so in front of you tonight, um, we have a request, uh, an amended request actually from a previous submittal uh, to establish a permit parking area uh, in the canyon, kind of the canyon center area of the city on Fort Union, Wasatch, Racquet Club Drive. Um, in blue there is the petition area, the area requested for uh, the establishment of permit parking. It uh, encompasses Racquet Club Circle, which is the cul-de-sac on the bottom of the screen, and then the west side of Racquet Club Drive, uh, all along the west side of Racquet Club Drive up to the commercial uses there right on Fort Union. The uh, summaries or requests for a, uh, a permit parking area follow a, a pretty defined ordinance in the city, which is Title 11, Chapter 22. Uh, so that includes uh, very specific procedures and criteria needed um, to, uh, for a permit parking request to reach the council and then uh, again to recommend approval of that request uh, by the council. 
uh, it is a council. Uh, the council has the authority on these items, so staff will make the recommendation. We will take public hearing tonight, and then within 30 days, the council is required to take final action to either approve or deny the request. This particular requ particular request is uh, is to establish a permanent parking area, like I said, uh, in Racquet Club Circle in the west side of Racquet Club Drive. Uh, the, the stated purpose from the, the petitioner's narrative is to preserve the safety and integrity of the neighborhood in response to ongoing and future development at Canyon Center. And again, the stated rationale is that development in the area will lead to an increase uh, in commuter vehicles. Uh, and commuter vehicles is defined as vehicles that do not originate from the area. Uh, and uh, there is concern that uh, ongoing development will increase commuter traffic in the area. Um, whether that's from the public parking structure at Canyon Center, the hotel, future offices, apartments, et cetera. The uh, initial request that was submitted back in November only included Racket Club Circle. Staff expressed some concerns uh, that it didn't uh, meet the criteria of the ordinance at that time. Uh, so the uh, petitioner amended uh, his request to include an additional 10 parcels. So 18 total parcels now. Uh, 11 of which uh, the owners have provided signatures. So 61% of the affected owners have signed the petition. 50% uh, is required for consideration by the council. So uh, it, it meets that, uh, that specific criteria. I, I do wanna clarify though, uh, while uh, an additional area was included in the updated request, no additional uh, narrative information, uh, photos or, or other evidence was provided. Uh, so we're, we're still, using the original petition as our basis uh, for staff review. Uh, this is just a, a quick uh, graphic showing uh, which parcels signed the petition, which did not. Again, it, it meets over 50% signed, so uh, it, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter, but uh, we just wanted to demonstrate that. Uh, these are the two photos that were submitted in the petition. And it's been known to the city and, and anyone in this community for, for years, probably since prior to incorporation, that vehicles park, uh, especially on the east side of Racket Club Drive. And that's what's shown in the photos here, uh, both in winter and non-winter conditions. Um, we understand that uh, you know winter parking is often ski traffic, but it also includes patrons and employees of the nearby uh, businesses like Alpha Coffee and Porcupine Grill. Um, the, the, the one thing to note here is the east side of Racket Club Drive where these photos are showing vehicles is not within the requested permit parking area. Um, so there's a, a detailed analysis in the staff report, which the petitioner has received and so is the council, uh, walking through all the criteria in the ordinance and, and um, rendering a, a staff analysis of, of each item. Uh, that's summed up as shown on the screen here. Um, so staff, finds that while the petition must, does meet the criteria to require a public hearing based on the signatures provided, it does not reasonably comply with those specific ordinance criteria in 11.22. Uh, the request and the information provided to us to the, to the extent that we've had uh, that provided uh, fails to demonstrate an existing, uh, current existing issue with commuter vehicles parking within Racket Club Circle uh, and, and no additional clear evidence was submitted to us uh, to demonstrate commuter parking issues or the extent of it on the west side of Racket Club Drive. Uh, and, and again, the photos that were submitted are outside of the petition area. Uh, peti the petition identifies uh, concern of congestion and vehicles using the cul-de-sac to drive through and turn around, um, and also concerns of future congestion in the area based on uh, yet to begin development in Canyon Center, like the apartment building and the office buildings, the public park. Um, I don't think we disagree that, that those issues need to be looked at in the future. Um, however, when looking at the specific criteria in the ordinance, we are tasked with identifying and analyzing whether there's an existing parking issue in the permit area today. And if that parking issue uh, comprises a certain extent of that area. And we haven't, we don't feel confident that, that enough evidence of that has been submitted. Certainly the council can request more evidence be submitted to justify that. But from what we have, uh, we haven't seen that. That's not to say uh, the council shouldn't consider parking and traffic congestion in this area, um, but 
the, the last bullet point there, we feel that if there's concern about on-street parking, traffic congestion, um, circulation in the area, uh, pedestrian safety, you know, et cetera, there are other more universal um, options the council could consider, such as uh, limiting parking altogether uh, on public streets um, that would clear the roads. If there's a congestion issue or a, a circulation issue, adding signage can help do that. Um, only allowing parking during certain hours, um, certainly um, encouraging ski parking to utilize the new public parking structure, all things that the city can and, and maybe should work on. Uh, but for the purpose of this petition uh, and the analysis that staff is required to complete, we, we don't feel that enough evidence has been provided to reasonably conclude or recommend approval of the, the permit parking area. Any questions of staff? Thank you, Mike, appreciate that. <clears throat> With that, I will open up the public um, comment period <clears throat> and uh, we'll invite up Jeff Chatland. Thanks, Mayor, Council members. Seems like we were just here. Now we have a different, uh, and I, not to address Mike Johnson, but the photos if I submitted today will look exactly the same. So I don't know how we would provide more photos. It clearly shows the entire street. So I didn't take just one side of it. It's the entire road. I don't know if you want to show those again, but so I'm a little confused what I'm supposed to provide. I can go out today and show you the exact same photos a year, two, three years ago. So I had some great notes, but really we're just, we're just trying to protect our residential neighborhood. Mayor Peterson expressed concern, he says it's been a problem ever since he's been mayor, yet nothing's done on Racket Club Drive. My understanding is Racket Club Drive is a residential street, as is Racket Club Circle. It's not used for that purpose. It's overflow parking, it's employee parking. I did see some great new signs today, or Saturday, uh, free parking out of nowhere, like apparently underneath uh, the Marriott. And that's news. Nobody saw that coming. The arms are up. I saw six cars in there today. That's great. What I'm concerned with is it's not being utilized by the current businesses. Racket Club Drive is a mess. You can go there today. It's, it's not plowed. Cars parked there. Ordinances aren't enforced for snow removal 24 hours before, during, or after. It never happens. I've, in the 17 years I've lived there, never seen a tow truck. Never seen a citation. That's a clear and eminent danger to the public. We, we can't get the people on Racket Club Drive, can't retrieve their mail. And the reason there's not a huge outcry is all of Racket Club Drive is renters. It's zoned residential with renters living there. That's why they don't care. So we have a few other people that live here or on Racket Club Drive that will say the same thing, but Really, we're approving 85,000 square feet of, of office space. We just expanded apartments from the original approval, expanded it by 28 by a memo on a traffic study that was done in, I believe, 2015. What is it? 2015. That's old. Unless we're not seeing the growth in Salt Lake County, we've grown. Why are we using such an old traffic study? I reference that because that was the basis of expanding the apartments, which will cause parking problems. That street, Racket Club Drive, the renderings have front doors going to Racket Club Drive. We all know where they're gonna park. Okay, it needs to be controlled today. I like your suggestions on signs, times, but wait till those front doors, six or seven of them, hit that street. What's gonna happen there? It's gonna be a mess. The residents, their neighbors or friends, relatives, they're all gonna park in that street. So take those photos. That's what's currently the problem. That was a year ago, two years ago, five years ago. It hasn't changed. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> Appreciate that comment. And uh, Jennifer. on Racket Club Drive and I've lived there for 17 years and I actually 
have a townhome and I bought the adjacent townhome. So I kind of have two residents there now. And so it, it is kind of a reiteration exactly what Jeff had said that in the 17 years I've lived there with like, they, they do not plow, like they, the cars don't get moved. And so we have a constant parking and traffic issue for half the year. And like he said, that there's a lot of people that are occupying that street that are not residences. And it, it is gonna become a problem when you have now 250 basic cars that are gonna be driving through the neighborhood and the area. And then there are guests that will be parking on there. That will spill over into the circle area, I feel like for ski traffic and everybody, because there's no signage that limits anything. And so that also gets last plowed and cleared very well with the um, snow plow and the ski season. And as we've known that the ski traffic has increased and the population has increased significantly, even in the last five years. So it'd be nice if we could get some people to work with us on this and try and protect us since we're the taxpayers that have been living in the community for quite a while. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. With that, are there any other comments? With, with that, we'll close the uh, public hearing comment portion for 5.1. And please know that we will, we had a very good discussion in our business meeting about, about this and we will continue it. We will move on to uh, 6.0, which is our staff reports. And, uh, start with our, our police report from Police Lieutenant Van Bartlett. Good evening, and uh, I what I have for you is our, our our quarterly report tonight. And I know we have a couple new council members and a new mayor, so I will kind of explain some of these things that uh, Councilmember Bracken and Councilmember Pearson already know. Um, but to to kind of bring you guys up to speed, and I um, just to let you know, I mean, we're happy to to get you the information that you want to know. If you have something you want to see, something that you'd like to see in the presentation, please let us know. This is a a constant uh, changing uh, document that we do and, and people want different things. And so we're happy to change it and get you what you want. Um, you just gotta let me know. So with that, our uh, December uh, report here, we had 1,571 calls for service with 306 on view. This is, so on view cases are uh, officer generated cases where they see something um, that's going on and they, they generate the case themselves. The 1500 calls are what uh, we receive in through dispatch. It's like suspicious, suspicious, um, you know, pet stops, um, in the park after dark, you know, those different things. Um, and then a, a lot of traffic stops that, um, generate a case. And a, a general traffic stop that we make a ticket will not generate a case um, uh, that 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 we that we add into the to our case reports. And so it's these are above and beyond what a, a simple traffic ticket would be. Does that make sense? So, for the on view case would be could initiate a stop. Doesn't have insurance, has warrants. They might a whip here. There you go. <clears throat> our, so these are our average response times. And, and to, to let you know what our, our response times are, there's priority one, which are our highest priority calls. Priority two calls, which are the sec obviously second highest calls. And these are priority one, two, and three are calls that we do in person here. So our officers, you call, our officers will come. And so um, depending on the severity of the call, uh, we, we like to show you the breakdown of, of our response times for that. So when a, a person calls 911 or they call the non-emergency number, that call comes into dispatch. Dispatch, dispatch goes through, um, it's called Pro-QA, and it's their questioning to get people, where are you at? What is going on? All those different questions that they ask. Once that information is compiled um, and it's put into a, a dispatch screen, it gets pushed out to the officers, 
the timer starts for the dispatch time. And so what you see is the amount of time it takes dispatch to get that call out to the officers. Um, we are working constantly with VEC to get them to push those calls out as quick as possible and, and get the information out to the guys. A lot of times they'll put out very minimal information to get the guys rolling and then update it as the guys are going. So the faster we can get there, the faster we can deal with the problem. And so uh, the dispatch time for us is very important as well as the officer's travel time. So what you see is our dispatch time for the officers to get the call and get going and then the average time that it takes our officers to get somewhere in the city to the actual call itself. So when the guys get a call in from dispatch, they say, I'm on my way or I'm en route. Um, and then it the travel time it takes them to get there. Once they get there, they tell dispatch that they've arrived. We would like to be in the four to six minute range um, for priority one calls, uh, for all that information to come in, our guys to get it, to get in their cars and get where they go um, safely. Um, we'd like to be in the four to six minute range and we are constantly working on uh, better ways to improve that with VEC. A lot of this gets tied up with VEC. Travel time is what it is. Um, and this is an average travel time. If a guy's down uh, at rush hour at, at Union Park and they got to get all the way up to Wasatch, we know we have to navigate through all that traffic to get there. So and sometimes they're right around the corner. So this is just an average of all of our calls for the month. And so, as you can see, um, we're in the three minute mark for average dispatch time and, and officer travel time on our party one calls, but our party two calls are pretty high. We had a couple of um, calls in there that that um, sat for a while. It's a officers will call, they'll say that they're on their way and then they'll forget to say that they've arrived. So we have those disparities in there and we are constantly working to fix them. An example of a priority. I'll just say. Like a vehicle burglary. The easiest way to think of it, Mayor, is priority one calls involve an imminent threat to life or property, and those are the most pressing. And just for the purposes, um, uh, for those who might not be aware of how the system works, we are dispatched through what he is referred to as back. It's Valley Emergency Communication Center. That is a unified facility down by Kearns High School. So all 911 calls and calls uh, to, for, to West Valley, West Jordan, South Jordan, Riverton, Harriman, Cottonwood, Holiday, all those are routed to that center. And then the person is, in, you know, the caller is interrogated and, and then they populate a screen, uh, which generates uh, the cue to us to respond. And that is the number that you see here, which uh, seems a little high. But so you know, that 329, that clock starts ticking when they answer the phone. So we don't know how long it's taken them to answer that phone because that's not included in that number. And therein lies a concern that we're working on. And you know, Chief, we've, and Lieutenant Dan, I like to say Lieutenant Dan, <laughs> but uh, we, we've had a great discussion about this. Uh, Beck is in the two years I've been here, it's been discussed constantly because I know that your response times, once you get that information, is amazing yeah. but boy if you don't get that call to you and if they get a recording or something through VEC I mean that will be remedied I think through our discovery on this and it's been it's important to our residents when I when I talk to, to residents when things have happened and they say you guys got here so fast or it seemed like you took forever to get here it's important to our residents that we get there I know that you know that in certain jurisdictions it's well documented in this valley if you call you might not see a cop for six or eight hours right? Because they have so many calls and they have backloader calls and they're down staffing and stuff like that. In our city, in Common Heights, people expect it to be there and they expect us to be there fast. And so we are constantly working to tweak that and get there as fast as we can safely. Um, you know, so we're, we're, we're always working and we're trying to work with VEC and we're trying to work with dispatch. And, you know, we, we had a healthy discussion with VEC today about a, a, some issues. So we're always trying to work and get through this and make our response better for our residents. We catch more bad guys. We save more lives. Um, I know fire, it's important to fire for the same thing, for the same reason. So we, this is something that we constantly work on, which is why you guys are going to see it every time I'm up here presenting. You get, so you know where the dispatch times are. And you can see if you go back through um, every month, I, I, I uh, drop a, our, our monthly stats. You can see where we're at and how the times have gotten better. They, they were really good, then they slowed down. We moved over computer systems, and now they're starting to get better again. So we are start, we're, we're constantly working on it. So, Lieutenant or Chief, do, does uh, would VEC have the ability to uh, provide the data of how long a call, a 
um, was coming in as well. Is We've asked for that. Data? We're kind of, we're having a hard time getting it. They so have it, a new, is it something that they track? Yeah, they have a new phone system that they just implemented that they're trying to work the bugs out of and they're saying that we can get it. We just haven't got it yet. I don't mean to put you on the spot. This is something I've never asked for before, but due to, there's been some recent comments. Could you maybe for the next report, I would be curious to how many of the dispatches occur where the officer starts at City Hall as opposed to elsewhere. Maybe you've got to, you can just take a stab at it now. Well, the reason being is I know we have had the policy that the officers should be out in the city somewhere and they'll usually get dispatched from another location. But I'm kind of curious. The majority of the, the majority of the calls that we get, the officers are not here at the office. I mean, there's the three briefing or general briefing times of the day where officers are here, where they start their shifts at six in the morning, two in the afternoon, and eight o'clock at night. And if calls come in generally through them, but the guys don't, it, it's not like, Sorry to pick on you, Riley. It's not like the fire department that, you know, they're at the fire department a lot. And then they get called, they, they get dispatched. Our guys are out in the field. We ask them to be out in the field. Uh, I'd have to go back through a lot of GPS well, I, data and figure out how to, I don't know how. That's not too I much trouble. It. I would appreciate it. But let me look. Not, at, I don't know that I can, but let me look at it and see if it's something I can put together. Cause I, it's two different systems. Our, our vehicle GPS is not, it's not VEX, it's ours. And so we'd have to go back. Let me, let me look. I'll let you know. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions about response time? I just love what you, our police force does. I think we've got one of the best police forces out there. Thank you. I, I just don't you. want that chain to be broken on back to get it, your information. Cause I know I've personally seen what you guys have done. And, and we don't either. Right. And we're constantly working with them and they're, you know, they have staffing issues and, you know, they're servicing 30 different entities out there. So we're trying to, you know, we're trying to get this all squared away and worked out with Beck. And it's a constant, I don't want to say battle, but it's a, we're, we're constantly working through it. And I know um, Tim sits on the, the, the Beck board and, you know, he works through it too in, in his capacity. So this is something that we're constantly working on. Yeah, if I may just add tomorrow, Chief Roos and I are meeting with uh, Executive Director Scott Ruff about this issue specifically. He's coming here to meet with us. We've requested a conversation with him and I know they've been meeting with others as well, but we're gonna have a very frank conversation about this tomorrow. And that's all we ask is we do wanna make this a smooth process. And it, it kind of, a lot of the people that call in don't realize that it's going through a VEC system. And I think when the chief has to get called personally to go get something going that we've got a little bit of a weak link there and anything we can do to try to get this uh, your have your best efforts because if you don't hear about it for four minutes or five minutes that time and when a resident has a very pressing issue five minutes might seem like well, you know, it seems like five days, and, and yeah, I understand this, yeah. right? And everybody that we deal with, we certainly understand it, especially if there's an emergency or, you know, right. someone's life is in danger or, you you know, something's going on, right? Someone's breaking into their house. We know every second counts. Yeah. Fire knows every second counts. This is something that we constantly work on, and we will continue to do so. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay. So uh, overall UCR crime view, um, UCR is the unified or uniform crime reporting. This is the stuff that gets reported to the FBI. Um, every police agency in the nation reports this stuff. And so what you see uh, here is a comparison of, of those major things that get reported to the FBI for December of 20 and December of 2021. Now I'll tell you our December 21 numbers are a little low because this council meeting fell at the beginning of the month. It takes us a little time to compile all the data. I put forth what I could since we're so at the, since we're at the beginning of the month. I was getting ready to compliment. Well, I wish I wish I could say it's 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 lower than 111. I'll tell you that. But uh, but there's a couple of things that we're still waiting to come through uh, the system and trying to make it through. So um, it, it's not 56, but it's lower than 111. And this is uh, this is something that we will report every single month. You'll see it every single month. So these are what get reported nationally, um, and everybody reports it. Of course, we get a ton more calls than what you see on this list. Um, but this is what we have to report to the FBI. And I've got a question for you. Sure. Burglary, just to clarify, the difference between a burglary and a theft, is it getting inside of a, of a home or something, burglary versus yeah. theft? It, so like a, if you, you, you go into someone's home and you steal items, if everybody says I got robbed, yeah. that's not, it's not robbed, right? You were burglarized. Uh, you go into someone's vehicle and you break into their vehicle. 
um, then that you've committed a burglary, a vehicle burglary, or a home burglary, or a business burglary. A theft would be your shoplifting. Um, would it be mail? It's mail stealing theft, mail off stole the... a bike out of their front yard. Gotcha. You know, that, those aren't burglary; those are theft. And so uh, th that's the difference between the two. Thank you. Our arrest for the month, as you can see, it's 53 arrests and we got 56 reportable cases. We have a little bit more, you know, this, the numbers, we're trying to get the numbers all worked out for the beginning of the month. Um, we had 53 adult arrests and 18 juvenile arrests. And I know that's a lot. Um, the kids got a little rowdy this, this last December and, and we had to uh, issue some citations. Traffic citations, and I don't have all the citations in yet for the month. Um, I like to, we like to float around 225 to 250 in, in written citations and about half that for warnings each month. That is what I, that's what I ask of the guys to do. Um, that's a, a number that we see as reasonable for traffic enforcement and parking enforcement and those things. So we've asked the guys to kind of keep us around that number between 225 and 215, about half of that for warnings. All the warnings that we write are tracked or in the system. The guys can go in and they can, when they run your information, they can see that we've issued you a warning for speeding before, or we've issued you a warning for seatbelt before. We only issue one warning. So, um, you know, we track all that. If that makes sense. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, a question I would love to um, be able to respond to my constituents. Sure. Um, a lot of them uh, have been talking to me about uh, enforcement. Uh, well, we had a sample of that tonight with Creek Road, of course, Wasatch Boulevard and 3500 East. I could kind of go on and sure. on. Uh, and so I'd be uh, really interested to know if we could get a breakdown on what kind of things are being cited. Uh, for mm -hmm. instance, I had someone ask me, well, you know, what about citing for texting while driving? Okay, you know, because of course we know that that's leading to a lot of accidents and, and the uh, perhaps, you know, what, how many of them are for speeding. It'd also be interesting to know what districts uh, those citations are being written in. Uh, I can probably, I think I could heat map it for you and I'll show you a heat map in a minute. You'll see a heat map. I could probably heat map it for you. When we kick out the citation information, there's like 1,100 different things that we can write on there. <laughs> so, I mean, if we if I showed you the code that came through with the citation thing, I mean, it's it's very large because it has state, county, city codes in it. Well, maybe I could work with Tim. Um, you know, I have a few ideas. You know, perhaps if, if my constituents are particularly asking about certain kinds of citations, well, I can tell you. I, I can tell you. I can tell you how many parking tickets we've done. I can tell you how many speeding week tickets we've done. We I can pull that information for you. Um, drilling it down to the exact. It, it, I can I can get close, so Maybe it's I can the top work. five. The top. Yeah, well, I, yeah. well, just like in the CH tomorrow survey, I mean, it seems to be. Oh, excuse me, it seems to be throughout the Cottonwood sure. Heights city. Yeah. A lot of people want to see traffic calming, yeah. and it would be so great to be able to say because I, you know, I have them come to me, and you know, they'll say. I never see citations being written on Wasatch Boulevard, for instance, yeah. you know, and so it'd be so nice for me as a council person to, to be able to say, oh, well, let me just tell you, you know, there were this, you know, yeah, sure. to, to, yeah. to try to help them feel some level of, uh, you know. I, I can definitely, I, I can definitely do a heat map and I can do a heat map for like speed and parking. Um, I can, I can put that together. Let me work on this and see what we can do. Um, that doesn't kill my staff too much, but let me see what we can do. And I can tell you in the case of like Creek and Danish, um, you know, with them, we put our, we have speed trailers and then we put the speed trailers out. It collects all the data. And what it tells us is how fast the cars are going in that area. We work off the 80th percentile on that. We know that there's one offs. People are driving really fast and stuff like that. We get that. The traffic data that we have for Creek and Dana shows us that, that most people over 80% of the people are, are within the speed if for that area. And if people have concerns or whatever, um, they're happy to either we'll, they can reach out to us. We'll get the trailers out. We'll, we'll give them the data. We'll tell them exactly what the speeds are at for that area. I can tell you what the speeds are on Wasatch. We know it's, it's, it's well documented. Um, and we know that there's the one-offs of people doing 60 down the road. We understand that. And we work to, to, uh, to write them. And we do write a lot of traffic tickets on Creek Road. We do write traffic tickets in the four-way stop. And if people bring that to us, we will address it. Certainly. I sent an email off while I was sitting here. Hey, get me the trailers out back to Creek and Danish. I want to know where the speeds are at and we'll do some enforcement. It's, it's that simple. Um, all people got to do is communicate to us and we'll get it out. And I happen to be sitting here tonight and listen to it. So I sent it out already. Um, we're good to do that. And I will try to get you some more ticket data. 
that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Chief Russo and I've had some good conversations and you know, I'm the one that always says roads are dangerous by design. So I, I there's no way you can catch every speeding person. Yeah, yeah. And and I know as a city, we'll, we'll be talking about, you know, these challenges on the roadways because you're off as office, you can't catch every one of these people. You, are... You're right, because we still have to respond to all the calls for service and there's, mm -hmm. there's not an army out there. And I will piggyback on, on what Lieutenant Barlett mentioned, and that is people's perception of those cars that are going down the street and what the actual data is, sometimes that can be different. And so I'm happy to actually bring that some of that data back to you on that particular area that was just discussed. And so you can see what the numbers actually reflect. I'll tell you what one of the uh, struggles for me is that I used to have, they, they weren't quotas, they were uh, performance standards because I thought that before all of you can go home tonight, as you drive home, you will wish that you had lights in your car because you'll see somebody do something like silly enough that you think they deserve a ticket and you can write a ticket on the way home. So there's no reason that an officer shouldn't be able to write a ticket a day, say. So we used to say you work four days a week. You should probably write what, should, like three tickets a week. Is that too much to ask? That's not a crazy quota or anything. That's just I have to be able to, you want it done, you have to measure it. Unfortunately, the Utah legislature a few years ago passed a law that says, I can no longer do that. I can't tell them to write tickets. I can't give them, I can't measure their work product by tickets. And so those numbers go down because there is there is no way to, uh, we can't penalize them for not writing tickets. We can't demand that they write more tickets. Um, we can ask them enough, and, we, and we do ask them. We just say, hey, we've got, and our officers are good. Right, they get it. If we say, hey, we're having a problem with Creek and Danish with four way stops and people running speed, they're gonna go out and they're gonna take a look at it. We can't make them do it, but we can ask them to do it. And our officers are good officers and they go out and do it. And, and there is a cost to writing tickets, um, and which you'll learn here soon. Uh, we have to pay for the court. We gotta pay for the prosecutor. We gotta pay for the defense. We gotta pay for all the administration that goes along with it. And the state takes most of the ticket money. And so, you know, we have to have a delicate balance of, of, of that, and it's not a black hole for the city, you know, and so we, we understand this, that there's a fiscal note attached to it. Everybody thinks the city writes more tickets, the city gets more money. The state takes most of the money from the tickets. And so, but we want to make sure that we maintain uh, our, our core, and we don't have to shell out a lot of city money for that core, you know, and our DUIs we get a lot of money for DUIs and stuff like that that come in. And, and so we just try to may have a delicate balance of citations and warnings, because I think education is important on the, for these people. So we warn people too. So there's a big, I mean, it's a, there's a lot to go into traffic citations, if that makes sense. Thank you very yep. much. Yep. I, I don't want to, I, 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 the, uh, the chief was being very nice in his, I was, as someone who has stood out on a wide variety of roads over the last 15 years with a speed gun, the perception, the people that you notice doing bad things in your neighborhoods are usually that 15%, the extreme. Standing in your front yard, everyone's always, your perception is that they're going faster than they really are. Because I've been standing next to the neighbor, that person's going 35 miles an hour, I says, there's 26 right there. That's that's human nature, and so th and that's why and I was gonna say yeah, if you've got the speed data for there, I'm I'm, I, one of, I'm a traffic. I have the speed data for that for that uh, intersection, and I'll put it back out and I'll get it again. Yeah. For Burrell, please send it to me. Yeah, no, I I have the speed data, and I I have it for that intersection, and I'm happy to get it again. And what we, unfortunately, what we see when we do this, and we go out, and we start writing citations, that most of the people who write the citations do live in the neighborhood. Th that's also absolutely very true consistent that's they're it. not here it's very true so we, we i mean that's that just part of and we had that happen literally in my district they said these people are just flying down the road and sure enough we put the chief was nice enough to set it up and said we'll tell you every speed everyone's going two of the people ended up getting cited that were complaining about the speeding yeah. happens all the time this is a very yeah. common for us. And it, it was kind of comical and sad at the same yes. time. Yes. But it, and it was very telling, though, to see those speeds. Because I live on a little private lane, and it's scary. I've had to put up those signs. You drive like your kids live here. 
And it, it, when you're standing still and that car's going by 20, 30 miles an hour, it's really fast. It's very difficult to judge speed. Yeah. People go to school for that. But it is, it's a difficult thing because you, you want safety and everything that we can do to mitigate those Absolutely. tragic situations. And we, we, the chief, we will put out whatever we need to. We will do whatever we need to. If it's a problem for our residents, we will address it. We just need to know about it. Fair enough? Accidents. Sorry, let me back that up real quick. Uh, DUIs, we had 14 DUIs for the month of December. So we had uh, 40 accidents. So our, the, the 40 is um, reportable non-injury accidents and the 10 below is injury accidents. Our goal is to keep this number down as much as we possibly can. We do that through traffic calming and speeding and tickets and things like that. But you see the spike this time, what clearly weather related. Which is always the case, especially here. So this is a, what you see here is a, a three months in review. We like to do this when I come before you guys, we'll kind of give you the three months so you can see the trend of, of what it is. And of course, um, these are all things that we showed you on the UCR with our traffic tickets and stuff like that. We just want to give it to you in one in one table. Uh, we include our code enforcement uh, data in this. We now have two full-time code enforcement agents going uh, or officers going for us. And so, as you can see, kind of a breakdown of what they do. Our, our animal and code enforcement, they do the both together. So I have two guys that handle all animal control and code enforcement complaints for the city. We get a lot. Um, they do a lot of work. They're very busy, uh, those two gentlemen. And they do a wonderful job. So I just give you guys a breakdown of what they do. Um, the council has asked about, uh, about deaths in the city. Um, unfortunately around the holidays, we get a lot more. Um, so this for the month of December, we had three attended deaths and four unattended deaths. Now an attended death is a person is under the care of a physician. Um, they were, uh, you know, they, they, there were some mouth issues and stuff like that. An unattended death, obviously an unexpected death, um, that we go and we, uh, and, and we, we investigate included in that are overdoses and different medical related things and stuff like that, that are unexpected. Um, I will take, I'll give you a case from this last month on Christmas Eve, a family from out of state was here staying at an Airbnb, not a legal Airbnb, but an Airbnb in the city. Um, and uh, they had brought their family with them and they had an adult daughter that they brought with her who uh, overdosed on, and, on ketamine and fentanyl. And if you don't think we have a fentanyl problem, here in the wonderful city of Palma Heights, we do have a fentanyl problem here in the wonderful city of Palma Heights. So, I mean, on Christmas Eve, this, this young lady passed away um, from an overdose while on vacation here skiing. Um, these are the type of things that we see that we deal with regularly. This is a heat map. Um, so this kind of shows all the reports that are taken. This obviously is the map of our city, right? You can see our heaviest congested area is the Union Doug's Park. House. Yeah, Doug's at house, Union Park area. That's where we get most of our calls. In fact, 30, the third of our calls, all call cities, all the calls in the city are in that little area of, of corner of Collin Heights. And it's always been that way traditionally. I um, mean, obviously you can see up the Fort Union corridor, um, it's a little busier and then along, um, you know, Highland and that area. So um, there, there's a red spot there at the high school. Is that probably in relation to the juvenile arrest? Went up with Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, and, and it, this changes from month to month, but it's kind of nice to see that area. Like you can think about it, but it's nice to see it on the map. I'll give you another one. There's property crimes, right? These are the property crimes. And you can see how the property crimes are spread across the, the, the city, but obviously we have more in that area of the city, right? And our officers know that we spend a lot of time down there. And Dan, it's a lot of that because of high density there in the the biggest blue spot with a little bit of red. Yeah, some shopping areas. And a lot so of it people. amplifies yep. what's yes, going on. Yep. But right. You have the box stores. Box stores. Is I mean, yeah. always oh. and we're there all day long. With those. Are we still stuck on that? They can still up to we, we a certain have, amount? We have never subscribed to that. No, not you, but no. the store's policy, no. I thought, changed. Store, actually, I don't believe that our stores have that policy, correct? No, we have we have a store that has that policy. Absolutely. One of the stores. One of the stores, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think I know through deduction. You, you know, could we, probably figure it out. But yes, one yeah. of our stores doesn't call us anymore for. And what's the the limit? It's, there's no limit. It's just what they, it's a store policy. They made the store policy. It's a national store policy. Like when I mentioned the limit, California has a limit, right? Anything on dollar $900, amount, $900. Yeah. Right? And they, you've seen what's happened in fair California for this. So um, we don't want to see that here, but one of the stores is national change, change their policy. So they just don't arrest them or call you. Yes. yes. So it's a shrinkage and, and they, they plan on that. Yep. You pay more for that. Um, our safety message for the month, I, I try to give a safety message for the month. Um, it's uh, National Slavery and Human Trafficking Month. And, and um, I know that uh, this happens everywhere, all over this world, all over, all over this nation, all over this state, this happens everywhere. And if you don't know what, um, what human trafficking is, you should educate yourself as to what human trafficking is. You would be surprised. We work with the FBI. We work with Operation Underground Railroad. We work with uh, all of our federal partners um, to try to uh, smash any, anything that we believe is human trafficking or sex trafficking or anything like that. And it happens, if you think it doesn't happen here, it happens here. So we wanna bring awareness and, and to people and, and know that uh, if someone believes that if something like that is going on, they call us and we will certainly investigate. That is all the information I have for you. If you have any other questions for me or anything like that, please ask away. I'll work on your wants and wishes for the next presentation and I will let you know. Thank you, Lieutenant. Thank you. We are blessed to have the police department that we have and, and, and the fire. So uh, thank you for that all you do for us. Thank you. Matt. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Congratulations to the new faces on. Oh, they're all over here. Look at that. Nice. To, I, I got to figure out how to run my computer. So I'm not as adept at this as the police are. It is a blessing to have Lieutenant Dan. Uh, so. This is, uh, like you said, we do the quarterly reports and have no idea what's going on. Uh, how do I start my slideshow? There we go. Okay, uh, so this is the public works just for uh, the new folks on the council. Public works is the department and underneath public works, we have the operations and maintenance as well as the engineering divisions. Um, I myself am the director on the public works department. I also hold the uh, position of city engineer. So I kind of get to wear two hats as we go through these things. So I get to report on what's going on in the department overall. Um, although my reports aren't as uh, nice and really cool as the police reports, I get to talk about asphalt and snow. So here we go. We'll see how this thing turns out. So uh, on our quarterly report, one thing we like to do in January and also in the next quarter is kind of give you an update on what happened with the snow um, and where things are. Just to give you, let you know, we do track all that goes on with the snow in the city and things that are happening. Um, so this year uh, we are down, down here at the bottom and you can see that our October and November we had, we didn't get any snow. Um, and I track it on the fiscal year, I should say. So, and in December, we got 48 inches of snow. And what the other numbers are telling you is the number of tons of salt we toss out. So about 1,500 tons of salt. And we traveled around 12,600 miles um, plowing snow. Um, we track all of this information, just so you know. We have the same as the police department. We have GPS in all of our trucks. So we know their speeds, their locations, when they pass by a location if their blades are up, if they're down, if they're throwing salt, we can pull all that information at any given time. So we use that to one, improve our efficiency, but also to manage calls that we might get um, when residents wanting to know how things are going. So just to give you an idea, like I said, since we've started uh, the public works department, we've been tracking our usage and 
you'll see that things, uh, and so far this January, we've had two inches of snow. And so it's been pretty quiet. So, so far we've pushed about 50 inches of snow throughout the city. Um, this is just the report for what happened in December. This is where we get our data from. We track, like I said, we track all of this information, but what we try to do, you'll notice on there is pounds per mile. Um, that's the amount of pounds we, of salt we throw down per mile we travel. We try to keep it at around 240 um, on average. And uh, so far the crew is doing pretty good. They are at about, like I said, we track it at about 237. It's not an exact science because we use a loader to load them and we don't have a scale on them, but we have a general idea of the density of it. Um, and here's the, no, the, uh, the record for January. Any questions so far about the snow removal and what we do? I do want to emphasize while I'm here, just for the council, we are a snow plowing operation. We are not a snow removal operation. <laughs> so Sorry. we move snow from one side of the road to the other to make it passable for people to get through. A lot of times we'll get those calls and you will start getting those calls. Sorry, but welcome. Um, why isn't the snow gone? Well, I long as it's cold the snow is going to be there and we do our best so we put down salt and we melt it we plow it we melt it we plow it and that's kind of the operation as it goes mayor may i make a comment on that so in the council communications that i send out each friday uh, and i'll be sending it out this week is i'll give a paragraph about our process as far as if you get complaints where you can refer people to um, so i hope that will help you especially the new council members and mayor. Um, so, so it's important. We, we know a lot of times by the time you get a complaint, um, we're, we're already dealing with it. It's already something that's, that's being addressed. So I'll send that this Friday. So you'll see that and it'll be a reference for you as well. Matt, I think this storm was one of those very large storms. I mean, my parents' house, um, I think about 18 inches or so or just on 30th east uh, and it was a heavy wet snow and so some people don't understand that that's a lot of snow right and they we do and each one of us in each district has gotten calls and right. pictures of mountains of snow you don't have a front loader to move some of that and some of the circles they you know people can be pretty critical and not understanding but I just got one on social media. It's been this many days and look, we still have snow. And so I think, and somebody said, why don't you contact the city? And so is that the best process? If there's, if in the photo, it still looks pretty bad, is the best thing to call the city and say, we've got a problem here, send you a picture and, and you guys yeah, will go can, take care of it. They can send, they can call in and we, we keep a snow log and we track all the calls and we follow up with those calls. So a call to you is, is the number a one call thing. to the city hall. Yeah. And they will, right. they will log that and we do track it. Um, misconceptions. Once again, we don't remove it. We just push it. A lot of times it has not warmed up uh, really that much. And when it does warm up, it tends to melt and we try to get in there and sl what we call slushing it off. We salt it, hope salt, make, get the salt working. We try to slush it off, but you can only take off so much ice at any given time. It only melts it down to a certain point because once, once the salt and the salt water hit a certain uh, percentage, it ceases to be it ceases to work at lowering the melting point. So then we slush that off, and then we kind of keep working our way down till we hit bare road. So it's a it is a long process to get ice off of the roads. It's not as uh, simple as just that. The blade does not ride it. It right. chips away at the slush as it goes. Some of the, the biggest complaints, and I don't know, and I called you, my parents live right on 70th, is that wall of ice and snow yeah. blocks them in. And it's like chiseling through kind of soft rock. Yeah. And it's difficult because you can't get in and out. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens to almost everybody on a major street. They get it all cleaned up and then boom, they're hit with a wall of of frozen because it's been salted and it's frozen refrozen i don't know what the i don't know what the solution is well it's when your roads like fort union some of these larger roads that we do plow if you when you drive it I'm, i don't know if you've looked real close and well maybe you have at fort union but there is nowhere Push there it. is no shoulder there's a six inch shoulder and then it's straight into property 
So our job is to open those lanes up for traveling public. And when it gets cold, um, it, especially like you mentioned, this last, well, the one on the 15th, I believe, was a very intense storm. It was a short duration, but it came down with 18 inches and 18 inches in 12 hours. That's a, that is a major storm. I, there's no other way to put it. And when that happens and then it freezes that night, the snow that comes off the plow is wet and it'll freeze and the snow is always gonna fall off the plow. We're asked, well, why don't you turn your blades straight? Well, they don't build trucks that big to be able to push a wall of snow straight in front of you. We have to, some of it has to fall off. And unfortunately, some of it does fall in driveways. Um, we do feel bad about that, but we do our best not to do that, but it happens. And we, we, we I, I don't have the staff to go around and clean, you know, 15,000 driveways. No, I understand that. I, I'd love it if you gave me the staff to clean 15,000 <laughs> driveways, but I just don't have that. No, but I appreciate what you do. And I, I, like I say, when I told you, I said, I don't have anywhere to put that snow. No. It's, and so it's, it's difficult unless you had a huge flame th thrower that you could kind of rent out. And that's that's not that's not a problem that is just in Cotton Ohio. That, that it's that is not unique, every yes. every single community. The community that I live in, I see the same thing and oh, no. the same complaints. I so totally agree. I just I don't know that there's an easy solution yeah, to let these people know that there's. It's uh, we've all been through the same war story. If you live in Utah. I, I can tell you about my road if it's still a two inches of ice on it but i just traverse it and walk real slow when i get in and out of my house so i don't, nope. I don't know but anyway any other questions on snow plowing and like i said for the new folks here i believe tim is working out at something we can sit down and visit and talk to you about that especially so that you know you can know the best way to answer it and you understand our process and how we're we're operating staffing is good matt what's that staffing is good yes we are fully staffed where we are um also if i could let me let me go back to snow plowing so you're aware of what we do i can only run my drivers for 15 to 16 <laughs> hours at any given time this last the big storm i actually ran them for 20 hours um it was a long fight on that when we know a storm is lasting because we know it was a short duration it was just a big amount of snow when we know it's lasting more than a day or so and it's coming in i actually have to split my staff up i have 12 drivers so at any given time on a split shift i'm running six drivers so we're not fully staffed if you're asking me that on a storm when i have to split the shift most cities and i'm not not complaining, I'm just letting you know, county, the state, Sandy, these cities our surrounding neighbors have full shifts when they go out. We are, we're at half shift whenever we go out. We try to do that at night as we can. And we try to be full shift on the morning commute and the evening commute and break up the night and the midday. So just FYI. And Matt, I. I just want to commend you guys. I saw those trucks out and I talked to Tim. He says, yeah, they're running. They're going to stop at this time because they've been going for that many hours. And I think they went even beyond the time that they were going to stop. But yeah. the trucks were coming and going because my parents live right on 30th East. So they're coming, I'm going. But I must commend them. It's a difficult job. Yeah. I think it'd be terrifying. I want to go on a ride along, but I think I'd be terrified. I will. I will. I will. Glad you said that. I will open the invitation to each and every one of you. If you would like to go on a ride along, you just give me a call. I will have a truck stop by your house, pick you up, and I will take you up in your area and let you feel what it's like to ride up and down those hills in a snowstorm in the middle of the night, dodging cars and doing those things. It's, it's an interesting ride. If you've never done it, you've driven cars in snow and you've seen the snow coming at you. I'll put floodlights in front of you driving an 80 ton truck with cars dodging in and out of you and trying it's it's a it's a harrowing experience for them maybe the 75 dollar ticket to lagoon <laughs> the, yeah it will but the invite seriously there is a serious invite for each and every one of you you just tim can get you my information if you just call me i will make arrangements for a truck to stop by if you see it's coming down and you want to go out you have a couple hours we'll we'll, we'll swing by and pick you up
not a problem. Okay, I, I, I invite you all to try it, see what it's like. It's, it, it is a great experience. Informative. May I, may I bring my grandson with me? Boy, we've got one seat. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll say, and, and I apologize for the passenger seat. It doesn't have the cushions and the springs. It's like riding on a milk crate, but we'll get, we do that just to make it worse on you. How's that? Okay, so capital projects, give you an idea of where we are. This is the engineering portion of it. Um, some of these things I believe are gonna be coming up in your retreat for these discussions, but these are some things that we're working on in engineering. The 1700 East sidewalk, we are in design, working on that right now, and you'll get more information later. This is a really brief overview. Um, we are on year four of our five-year road maintenance plan. Um, I'll show you a few things here in a minute, but uh, we have bid out the slurry seals for this year. They will start in March, um, and we'll start doing that. That's for year four in this fiscal year. So those things are going on. We will be bidding out the striping every year. We have to stripe the city, um, portions of the city, crosswalks, uh, symbols, all of these things. Um, but that bid will be going out in January. Um, 2600 East Sidewalk up in Tony Circle. That's a federal aid project. You'll be learning more about those federal aid projects as you go along, but that one is also under design and we hope to go to construction um, here in the spring and summer. Um, you already know about Ferguson Canyon Park. We are in a winter shutdown right now up there. The contract, the contract has been let. It is going forward. Um, I, I've written on here uh, city project for, you probably are already educated on this, but I'll remind you as I, well as I remind basically the public on this. There's two projects at the Ferguson Canyon Park that's going on. There is the city sponsored portion, which is the park project itself where it's city funds, where we got grants from community development, went out and chased a lot of grants. We got money, I believe, from the county. We, 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 we were able to put together those city funds. So that's one project. The parking lot itself is a federal aid project. So there are two distinct projects happening here. And I cannot mix those two. And if I do, then we lose our federal funding. So the parking lot will be starting in the spring and summer of this year. It is going through the federal aid process and that is happening as, we, like I said, as we speak. So it is in final review with UDOT and we're making some adjustments to make that happen. So we hope to be going out to bid. So there's two projects. It, it's gonna seem strange. Your constituents are probably gonna ask, why are they not building this at the same time? Well, it's, it's two projects, two contractors, two everything. And, and that's the way we were able to fund this thing, okay? Um, and then we have the Bengal Boulevard Highland uh, intersection um, improvements that will be going into the environmental phase. You'll be talking about this uh, in your retreat as well. Um, the improvement of that intersection is bicycle lanes as well as a multi-use trail um, starting from uh, just west of City Hall here going through the intersection and trying to improve that for both cars, bicyclists, as well as uh, the walking public, mainly for the students. If you go out here, you'll see a dirt trail that's been built in pretty good by the students walking down there. So that's happening. One thing I didn't write on here was the roundabout. The roundabout will go begin construction about mid-March. Um, now that is while school is in session, but there's, in the contract, they have things they have to meet to keep the roads open and everything of that nature until May, in which case they'll hit it really hard and road closures, lane closures, and those things will be happening um, to get the roundabout completed. It's at that point, they have 90 days to complete it once we hit that up in there. So the roundabout is moving forward. Um, any Do questions? Do have that parking or the traffic plan No, we have not gotten to that. No, we have not. I do have an interest in what I- what I understand you might have a little bit of a skin in this game. So yeah, we will We will be in for letting you know. Uh, as a Andy, resident, oh, sorry. Adjacent, sorry, as a resident adjacent to the project, as with all the residents, we will be informing in that, in that location. Okay, sorry, I didn't just real that. quick on the 17th East, I've yeah. heard that we did not get we that. We did not get the $150,000 funding. Right. So that's why, like I said, I believe uh, 
Tim has mentioned that. But we might be able to go a different route, maybe. We'll, we'll, we're playing with some ideas and we'll, we'll be bringing those forward. Yeah, that'll be on the retreat discussion for potential projects to, right. to consider so funding fun. in the budget process. Okay, thank you. Um, give you an idea of the five-year maintenance plan. Um, like I said, we're on year four. These are the maps we use to give you an idea. Um, these are projects that will be slurried. Uh, and I can give you an education at some point in time about the different road treatments. I don't think I'll do it tonight, but these are slurry projects or a heavy seal coat. And these are their locations that are happening. Um, you can see we've got quite a few that we'll be doing. Some of these will also be removed and be put into a reconstruction because they're so far gone at this point, it doesn't make any sense for us to do that. And I'll, exp I'll show you that on some other ones. Um, some other projects we've done that are part of the year four that are finalizing. We did reconstruct Alton Way. That was one of those that was actually on the project list for slurry seal, but it was so far gone that we, we adjusted funds, moved some things around, and were able to reconstruct Alton Way. Um, give you an idea, this is what it's looking like now. Uh, there is still construction that will be going on up in there, they are collaring the utilities. They're gonna be punching holes in the brand new road, raising up the concrete and doing utilities. Yeah, um, there on Alpen Way, uh, I had a, a couple of my constituents uh, wanting to know, in fact, see what uh, that picture, anyways, just north of where Alpen Way passes through Golden Hills Avenue uh, on the uh, east side of the street uh, where there is a storm drain, uh, there's a kind of a pile of uh, uh, yeah, the uh, those orange and white, uh, yeah. uh, and I don't know what all is there, um, but can I, because uh, the person who lives on the corner uh, where that um, fire hydrant is in your picture, uh, I think he said to me, well, is that going to remain there all winter? Because he was concerned it was creating kind of a hazard. I don't they, know are, I... they are moving in next week to start, like I said, start the collars. So they'll be cleaning up all their debris and getting it out of there. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to the contractor about anything that's in the gutters right now. Um, but they, they should be, like I said, moving in. To, it's still an active construction site. Okay. So there's, there's going to be some things that are left over. And so it's still, but I'll follow up with that. Great. I, I also had a constituent who uh, wanted to know, uh, going back to the roundabout there, that um, is going to go under construction. And I'm understanding beginning likely in May and then be finished within a 90 day period. Starting in March. Oh, March. March. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that's only a few months, but I guess he wanted to know more about the, how the students are getting across, uh, you know, Bangle Boulevard since they're parking there on the north side of the street and I think using the LDS parking lot. Not well. anymore. Oh, not anymore. No, the, the parking lot is open. I don't even oh, know. Oh, so you, we're answer. letting them park here and that's- No, the parking oh. lot at the school- Oh, open. has opened. We don't allow parking over here, nor does the LDS church at this time. If okay. they do, they're parking, that's a no-no. Okay. Yeah, there's, that, yeah, there's a, usually a couple people who figure that they need to. It doesn't usually get bad, yeah. but it does progressively get yeah, more Yeah, but the used. school parking lot the school is at full capacity on their parking. Everything's open right now. Now, he also expressed, I would be interested in reading the study and plans that have been developed. Is that, just, is that something on the website if he wants to see more about the, the study or plans related to the roundabout that he could access? What do you mean study? Uh, I'm not sure what he's referring to, but... Um, I don't, right, the plans. The plans are huge. I mean, they are... A, a big set. I mean, I, I mean, I can give. We can. We can. I believe we have on the website the layout of the roundabout, but the design is complete and signed off by the state as well as the in design engineer. So, I mean, we can show the layout if that's what we're looking for. Matt, didn't we have a graphic of that kind of shows the flow of it that I remember seeing it? Yes, we and do. It, and if, I, my, I, I can. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get with Tim and we'll put something together and show what, what I, what I, I mean, I, I, the plans are public. It's not, 
it's not like they're not. I mean, someone can easily come in and uh, grab all those plans if they want, but it, there's, it, it's designed and it's already going forward. So at this point. Well, I very much like roundabouts. I'll just go on the record. So uh, I, I'm just uh, trying it's, to respond. It's more to of an egg about anyway. And we can, we can toss about the roundabout. It's more of an egg about. So yeah, the police and fire and public works are mad at me because of the way it is. But emergency vehicles aren't, the, they're not their favorite thing. So let's put it that way. They're, they're difficult to navigate sometimes. But anyway, we, uh, any, question, any questions about this? We also, um, the racket club area, I guess we got a couple of projects up in your neck of the woods. Um, we redid those areas as well. Um, they are finalizing also. They have to collar the utilities. So the brand new road will be punching holes in them again, but fixing those up. So, and that is really where we, oh, and we over on Stone Road, we had requests for ADA ramps. Just give you a heads up. These are uh, for mobility of those with uh, disabilities. Um, so based on that request, we were able to install that as well over on Stone Road. And the resident was very well pleased, uh, very pleased, I should say, with, uh, with the outcome. Very well, I wanted we can to get in thank and do the that. city uh, for, for making that happen. So I thought I'd pass along his thanks for that. So we did a couple on 2030s a number of years ago for a, a local motorized chair. And that was, and that is that was great. That is it for my report. Are there any questions that I can answer or help with? Any? Okay. Thank you. And Thank you, man. Welcome. We pre appreciate you, the hard work that you and your staff do for our city to we'll allow us to home. drive. Thank you. Okay, the next item on our, our agenda is 7.0 where our action items. 7.1 is the consideration of resolution 2022-01 declaring certain property uh, surplus. So Tim, uh, either Tim or Chief Russo, who would like to? I can handle it. So uh, on the surplus items, there are two items. One is uh, Harley Davidson motorcycle. The model is a road king. Um, we use different models now. This is the oldest uh, bike in the fleet. Uh, that traditionally, we uh, rotate those bikes every uh, three or four years, there seems to be the highest value of return about that time for the bikes because we're buying them at the fleet price. Then when we sell them, we're able to um, get enough of a return to add just a little bit more city money and replace the bikes. The way the process works is once you declare it surplus and um, we advertise it, we sell it, the money comes back to the city, not the police department. And then if we want the money back, then we have to ask you for the money to be returned back in a budget amendment. So we're asking you to surplus that road king, which we've had some mechanical issues with, but we have since stripped out all the police equipment and we think we can sell to the retail public. The second item on there are the uh, additional taser devices. We've upgraded uh, to a new generation of taser, which is a less lethal um, electronic device that works on the muscle skeletal system um, that we use on violent um, offenders or people who are struggling. Um, the weapon looks different than a traditional taser or gun for reasons of, that you've seen in the news. This, this type of taser also um, activates the body-worn camera. It's a package uh, deal that we bought with taser, the manufacturer of the body cameras and the, and the, and the weapons. So once the taser is removed from the holster, it activates the body camera and it also has a device that we hook into our weapons holsters. So if the weapon, if your handgun is drawn from the holster, it'll activate the body camera. And you would think that that normally they would do that anyway. But as we saw in our last shooting, there were several body cameras, not from our agency, but from other agencies that were not activated during a shooting. And it just is, it is best practice and certainly makes my life easier to have those body cameras available um, on any um, critical event. Anyway, so that's part of the reason the last council was able to fund the tasers as part of that deal. 
we had to turn in all an equivalent amount of old taser devices, which taser does not service anymore. If we send one to them, they will not work on it. They don't insure it any longer. They won't on and on. But over the last uh, uh, 13 years that we've been a police department, we would acquire additional tasers here or there. I had grants. So we had more tasers to return th than we needed to. So there are some that we own is, that we didn't return to uh, Axon that we can surplus. Our idea is to ask you to surplus those tasers, which we have in our inventory, and then allow us to um, send them out to smaller agencies or other agencies that might not have any other resources um, to use. So. Great. Thank you. Any questions you, about that? Any questions? I try to give you the short version of that story, but. Chief, can we take the motorcycle for a drive along first? If you show me a motorcycle endorsement, brother, I will let you take it all over <laughs> anywhere you want. I, I don't know that I would advise you on these roads to take it. No, no, in the summer. No. And and do not ride it on Creek and Danish. But uh... <laughs> thank you, Chief. I will now call for a resolution or a motion, rather, on resolution twenty twenty two dash zero one. I'll okay. second it as soon as Sean pushes his button. <laughs> right. so I, I move to, to accept the um, suggestion that we surplus these items from the police department. I will second it. We have a motion from Council Member uh, Newell and a second from Council Member Bracken. Thank you. I will now call for the vote. And with Council Member Peterson. Yes. Council Member Bracken. Yes. <clears throat> Council Member Newell. Yes. Council Member Burrell. Yes. And I will vote yes. The next three items are all similar in nature. They are uh, a consider considerations, um, they're resolutions that require an official appointment to a board within our city. The uh, next one is uh, uh, resolution 2022-02, appointing Doug Peterson to the South Salt Lake, Salt Lake Valley Mosquito Abatement District Board. Have any questions or comments on this appointment? Well, I think one of the unwritten rules for this particular assignment is that you bring the uh, quarterly magazine wing beaks and <laughs> give any extras to former council members. I have to mention that no one in this room or in this city detests mosquitoes worse than I do. And I will do everything within my power. And I've studied this because I'm almost allergic to them because one mosquito bite will last a month on me. So if this is approved, I will go about this in a very aggressive manner. Thanks. I better, I moved we For Doug. I have a motion. And I abstain because of the whole situation here. <laughs> I second the motion. Thank you. We have a motion from Council Member Bracken and a second from Council Member Burrell. I will now call for the vote. Uh, Council Member Bracken. Yes. Council Member Newell. Yes. Council Member Burrell. Yes. And Council Member. A big yes. And I will vote yes. The next resolution is resolution 2022-03, uh, which is uh, the appointment of myself, Michael Wickers, to the UFA board. Uh, I, is there any questions or comments? Yes, Tim. Yeah, and it's for the UFA board and also to have the alternate uh, Council Member Bracken is an alternate because they require that as part of the UFA board. He helps very much. He never has to get up and go to a seven o'clock. <laughs> Questions or comments on this resolution? There are none. I'll call for a, a motion. I move that we approve resolution 2022 3. I second the motion. Thank you. 
We have a motion from Councilmember Peterson and a second from Councilmember Burrell. I will now call for the vote. Uh, Councilmember Newell. Yes. Councilmember Burrell. Yes. Councilmember Bracken. Yes. Councilmember Peterson. Yes. The last resolution is 2022-04, uh, which is also appointing myself to the Central Wasatch Commission. Any questions or comments about the CWC? Oh, so that's the thing we hear. I move that we approve resolution. Yeah. I'll second. Second. Thank you. We have a motion from Councilmember Bracken and a second from Councilmember Newell. We'll now call for the vote. Councilmember Burrell. Yes. Councilmember Bracken. Yes. Councilmember Peterson. Yes. Councilmember Newell. Yes. And I will vote yes. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is the uh, consent calendar. Uh, the, uh, the calendar uh, is a little different because we don't, only two of the council members were here when we had the agenda. <clears throat> However, I was in the audience. And so I'm going to uh, vote on it as well because I was here and listening. So um, this will, let's see here. Could I have a motion to approve these minutes? Mayor, I approve the uh, consent calendar. I'll second. Thank you. Uh, uh, let's see. Let's proceed with a voice vote. That's okay. All in favor say aye. 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 And 9.0 is adjourning our city council business meeting. I have a motion. I motion to adjourn. I will second that. Member Burrell motions to adjourn and council member Peterson is a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Adjourned. Great job.